morning, Kevin. Hey, Danielle. Hey, can you hear me? Just barely. better what about now yeah much better oh great good morning everyone We're about a minute away, Kevin. Um, so we can start on time and I can just keep an eye on the waiting room and just keep admitting people. Sounds good. And I apologize to everyone about the waiting room thing. I did not make that requirement. That is a new UNR requirement. Okay, uh, Kevin, before you start, I'm going to answer Jake's question here. Um, for people who don't see it, it's in the chat. It says, um, Danielle, how do we go about completing the expert review portion of the paper? Um, so you should see, here, let me share my screen really quick. Um, so if you see here um, under our current week, um, so you can... Uh, use this Dropbox here that says expert review. Um, oh, hold on, let me let the people in from the waiting room. Um, and so uh, all you need to do is have one person in your group have some confirmation um, of having someone from the UNR Writing Center, which you can do online, um, look over the, the paper in the rubric. Um, so this is different than the peer reviews that we did um, because they actually have some um, level of expertise in, in writing quality. Um, so one of the things that I noticed in all the drafts, I didn't mark anyone down for this um, in the last draft and peer review assignment, um, is that formatting um, is the biggest thing that seems to be wrong thus far. Um, and so uh, there's plenty of people who still have to work towards that uh, length of the paper, but it was fine for the draft. Um, here, though, you will have to have the paper in APA formatting. Um, people's formatting techniques seem to be all over the place. Um, so that's something that the uh, UNR Writing Center can help with. Um, if you can't get uh, UNR um, to uh, have a, an appointment for the Writing Center online, um, like if they're all filled up or something, 
um, then you can, or if you just want to use someone else, that's fine. Um, other, so if you're not going to get a conf email confirmation from them, you can use this uh, expert reviewer document. Um, and so some, Lacey would be considered an expert reviewer in this case, um, our TA, if you want to reach out to her or another grad student, um, or you can uh, go through the, the list of other people here who uh, I would count as someone above your peer um, to give your paper uh, another look over before um, that you submit it. So um, just any uh, documentation of someone more than a peer looking over the paper. So the email confirmation from the UNR Writing Center or this document. Does that answer your question? Yep, to Hannah Larson's question, yes. Um, if you know a grad student or you um, want to reach out to Lacey, then that's an acceptable expert. Okay, then it doesn't look like there's other questions for me right now. Uh, I will announce that uh, if you haven't um, started PVA uh, lecture one already, you should. Um, go ahead and do that by today. The other ones won't be due till the end of the week because Kevin's going to start walking us through um, those two uh, lectures today. Um, and you'll see that uh, one of our attendance verifications um, points that would have been from class is in this PVA lecture three. So once um, Kevin's only going to have like a, a kind of mini lecture here before he opens it up for questions. Um, and that's when I'll announce um, what that code is. It's not a code to open the quiz, it's just how you get that third point for participating today. What's the PVA lecture thing? Yeah, so um, that's how, so Kevin, um, if you look on the syllabus, um, I made an announcement that kind of walks us through this. Um, so if we were still in class, um, Kevin was scheduled for three lectures. Um, and so uh, since we can't do that anymore, he made this PVA short course for us. Um, and I walk you through which parts um, you should uh, be doing by today, because um, that's that first lecture. Um, but then if you go, uh, Kevin designed this uh, PVA short course, and you can just go step by step um, to, to look through what he's done. Um, he'll walk us through it this morning. Um, and just make sure that you've submitted the questions for each. Um, they're two to three points each. And he's like made videos. Um, if you walk through these, um, that are like 15 to, to 20 minute videos for each. 30 minutes sometimes, I think. <laughs> so I guess with that, Kevin, since, I mean, um, you're gonna be walking through us today, maybe I'll turn it over. And then if I can answer questions in the chat too. I'll stop sharing my screen. Sure, okay. Uh, first of all, hi everyone. I do see a lot of names that I recognize, many of whom um, are either taking my class now. So I teach a population ecology class. I should maybe introduce myself before I go <laughs> any further. Um, for those of you um, who don't know me, I'm Kevin Shoemaker. I'm an assistant professor in NRES, and my expertise is really uh, in population ecology and in modeling wild populations. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's great for me to be introducing this to you because this is, you know, such a big part of what I do is basically modeling wild populations and specifically trying to answer questions about how to manage wild populations in the most effective way. Oftentimes I work with rare species and you just can't like do experiments with rare species. It's just not really doable. And so uh, what we can do instead is to try to put all our knowledge into a model, the best model we can build for how these, uh, this population works. And then do experiments in the computer, essentially. Like what if we you know, add habitat? What if we change harvest regulations? Uh, what if we manage invasive species? and try to understand what the most effective management uh, solution would be. And this is such a fundamental part of conservation biology. And it has been really since the beginning of the field, the beginning of the time that we've really recognized conservation biology as its own separate field. Population viability analysis, which is the use of population models to answer 
important questions about rare and endangered species, um, including what is the risk of extinction. Population viability analysis has been a part of conservation biology from the very beginning. And so it's still an, a really important tool for understanding how to work with rare and endangered species and uh, what the most effective ways of, of managing them are. So it is, um, you know, that's why uh, Danielle asked me to come in and, and do this short course on population viability analysis. It's still and will continue to be a really, really important tool for conservation biology. And um, it kind of, uh, it, it allows us to apply concepts of population ecology and spatial ecology um, and statistics and all sorts of things. It just puts so much together and uh, allows us to, to really do some useful stuff. Um, I will say that um, with models, um, there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's a saying in, in the modeling world, I should say, that is uh, all models are wrong, right? but some are useful. So uh, it's an important thing, you know, as we get into modeling, that's really important to understand uh, that, that, that the truth of that uh, saying, I mean, all models are wrong. Models are simplifications, right? So um, by simplifying the world, which is really complex, we, we are, are wrong. You know, the models are wrong. But what we are trying to do is find that sweet spot where we can simplify the system, but add just enough complexity to make it re realistic enough to answer important questions. So it's always, you know, modelers are always having to make decisions between, you know, what, what do I include in this model? What's important to include? And what can I not include because it's not important enough? All right. So all models are wrong. Some are useful. Remember that. So um, <clears throat> that's my uh, really brief introduction. Um, let me share screen if I can do that. Um, all right, so hopefully you all see, um, th this is what you should see in, in your own uh, web campus. There, there's a PVA short course, it's kind of goes in order. Um, there's an introduction which if you've taken my class before, you can probably just skim or breeze right through. Um, there's one video involved in this and that just introduces the, the Insight Maker modeling tool. So if you have not used Insight Maker before, this is the tool that we're using to, to do population modeling. Um, then please watch the video. It's not too long and it does uh, just get you started with Insight Maker as a tool. All right, and then we can walk through the, the uh, let's see, the basics of population modeling. Um, there's a, a, at least one video associated with that, a couple of videos, um, one of which just introduces the concept of population modeling in, in conservation biology. And uh, the next goes through some really basic examples of population modeling. Now, um, those models, I should say, really, you know, on the balance of models are wrong and useful, those are really wrong models because they're too simple, but it's just a place to get started. So it's introducing the tools, the Insight Maker tool, how to get started with population modeling, um, and just some really basic concepts of, uh, you know, the, the elements that go into a population model. Basic vital rates, population vital rates per capita, uh, survival rate per capita fecundity, exponential growth. And then I talk about adding random number generators into our models. And that's a really fundamental part of population viability analysis because when we model real systems, we really can't predict the future with certainty. So we have to embrace that uncertainty by including random numbers because the randomness essentially represents the uncertainty we have about the system. And so by including those random number generators, every run, every, pi, every model run we do is a little different and we can run hundreds or thousands of runs and really encapsulate the full range of futures. Even though we don't understand the future, we can still 
project it multiple times and interpret the whole cloud of possible futures. All right, so that's the basics of population modeling. And then what we do is we go through a couple real world PVA examples, one of which models the uh, population dynamics of the Yellowstone grizzly bear population. So um, that population has been expanding over the recent decades. And we're asking questions about how many bears can be supported in the Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, and uh, just looking at the overall uh, future of grizzly bear population and trying to build the most realistic model possible to assist managers in uh, projecting and um, you know planning for Yellowstone bear management. All right, so that's what that one is. And then the uh, next real world PVA that we do is with the loggerhead sea turtle, which has a really cool interesting life history and it ha it's facing multiple threats. So this time we're gonna build a population model and then try to understand what type of threat mitigation efforts, that is, do we protect beaches? Because the, these sea turtles nest on beaches. Do we protect beaches? Do we go uh, and uh, introduce new regulations for fishing, for longline fishing? Because longline fishing can catch uh, these turtles as bycatch, or do we uh, introduce um, modifications to trawling nets to uh, mitigate the possibility that these, uh, especially the, the older juvenile um, individuals, often get uh, caught in shrimp trawling nets. So do we introduce new modifications to trawling nets that, that would allow these turtles to escape if they were caught in the nets. So that's what we're doing with the loggerhead sea turtle. We're going to look at alternative threat mitigation efforts and figure out which one is most likely to be successful. Um, so I think it, it really gets fun. I hope you all uh, appreciate how fun this can be when you can put all this information together into a model and start asking what if questions. We can start using these models to project the future under alternative scenarios and ultimately get some pretty interesting answers to conservation uh, about the conservation of species that we wouldn't otherwise be able to get. There's just no other real way to get answers to these really important conservation questions than to put all the information we know into a model and project forward. So um, it's useful, it's fun. Um, so I hope, um, <laughs> I hope that uh, many of you find it interesting and fun as well. Um, so that's, that's basically where we're going. There's a paper that I'd really like you to read that has to do with the loggerhead sea turtle PVA, but don't read it until after you've gone through the exercise. Because I want you to kind of puzzle through the uh, alternative threat mitigation efforts yourself before you read the paper because the paper really goes through the whole exercise including identifying which threat mitigation effort is the most successful okay so that is like reading the end of a novel before you you know before you finish so um, I'd like you to, to, to puzzle through that yourself um, if you have any questions about any of the PVA uh, components uh, or any of the questions that we're asking you um, or anything in general, just use this help forum. Um, and that way your question, you know, Danielle or Lacey or I will, will try to answer your question. And then if others have the same question, they'll be able to see it. So use that forum. Um, there's uh, PDFs of the lecture materials, uh, but that's all redundant because that's all on the web too. So in, in, if you wanted to print out anything, you could use that, but otherwise that's totally, those PDFs are totally optional. So that's how the short course works. And I can just briefly introduce the, um, the website. So this is, uh, you know, most of the content for this 
short course is available on the web. Um, you can walk through it at your own pace. Um, you don't necessarily have to watch my videos because really this is the same material, but if it helps to go through it as I'm going through it in the videos, um, by all means, watch the videos. <laughs> and um, this is where the, the material is though. So um, the link is on the module. So if you you know, click on the intro to P the PVA short course, you'll find the link to this website. So you can just get uh, started here. Um, this just introduces the, what we're doing. We go through some real basic population ecology, like exponential growth. We talk about this, this giant puffball, for instance. Now, all organisms are capable of exponential growth. It's kind of like this fundamental property of life that organisms can grow exponentially. Uh, that is, uh, even, if, uh, even if it's a really slow growing animal, like an elephant or something, it's capable of exponential growth. And with enough generations, um, the, uh, that species will take over the earth if they grow exponentially, right? So ex exponential growth is not super sustainable because uh, given enough time, enough generations, any organism growing exponentially will take over the universe, essentially. Um, the giant puffball is a good example because only in a couple generations it could take over the universe because it produces seven trillion offspring in one reproductive event. So by offspring, I just mean these little spores that are capable of, of producing another giant puffball. If, if all seven trillion offspring reached adulthood, the descendants from just two parent puffballs would way more than the entire planet in two generations. So that is impressive exponential growth. But again, all individual, all species are capable of exponential growth. It's a fundamental property of life. And I introduce uh, modeling, why modeling is really important. There's kind of this beautiful synergy between what computers are really good at, which is just iterating, doing mindless tasks over and over again, it's synthesizing different types of information into a single place, doing logical calculations. Computers are really good at that kind of thing. And then humans are good at, you know, thinking through problems, doing problem solving, being creative, uh, putting those, putting what humans are good at together with what computers are good at. We can do a lot of things that we couldn't do otherwise, including answer really important conservation questions. So that's what this is all about. Um, then I just introduce the Insight Maker modeling tool, which is a free web-based tool for doing what is called complex systems modeling or stock and flow modeling. And so Insight Maker is easy to use, it's visual, it's intuitive, so it's pretty easy to get started with, but it's also very powerful. You can do a lot with Insight Maker, um, including you know, what is commonly considered the, the basic tasks of computer programming. So by doing Insight Maker, by building your own models in Insight Maker, you are doing computer programming. It is a, it's a visual, intuitive programming language. So, um, you know, we go through some real basic examples, which I can do uh, with you now if you'd like. Uh, some basic examples in Insight Maker and um, just introducing some basic concepts of population ecology, including exponential growth. And then we start talking about stochasticity. It's just a big word, fancy word for randomness, stochasticity. So PVAs are generally stochastic because we, are, we, we can't predict the future. We want to be able to embrace the uncertainty we have about our real ecological systems uh, by using random number generators. And that, those are called stochastic models. Any model with one or more random number generators is called a stochastic model. So we do this, you know, this little visual test as if you're say at like an eye exam or something. Is this a more realistic model for a wild population or this model? This one <laughs> or this one? So um, if you look at this and are disgusted by how unrealistic it is, then you're well on your way to being a good conservation modeler because if you're like a theoretical mathematician, you love this because it's nice and simple. But if you're 
interested in real world systems and you want to model real world systems and you see something like this, it's like, well, that's probably not super realistic. First of all, it's saying we, we know the future with certainty and it's all smooth as if like there's no variability uh, in the system. That's not realistic. This should please you a lot more. <laughs> this is, there's variability in the system. Clearly we can't predict that kind of variability. There's just variability say in the weather each year that one year might be a really good year for the, the species that we're modeling and another year might be a really bad year for the species we're modeling and we just can't predict what's going to happen. Um, and so uh, this is much more realistic. If, we, if you look at real world population trajectories, if you monitor a population year after year for 50 years, this is more what it's going to look like than this. So to simulate that kind of variability and uncertainty, we incorporate random number generators into our models. This is called the deterministic model, um, and this is probably produced from a stochastic model. And so what we do is we introduce random number generators into our uh, population models. Random number generator is just like a lottery ball that you shake up, pull out a random value, put, put it back or record it, put it back, shake it up again, and pull out another random number from it. Um, it's just every time you pull out a number from it, it'll be a little different, um, but you know, it can be defined by, um, you know, there are several common probability distributions that we use in population modeling. If you take my population ecology class, we, we talk about that in a lot more detail, but we don't really have time for that now. I do, I will say, I put a bunch of extra material at the bottom of this uh, website. If you are interested in going a little bit further and reading more about random number generation or, uh, you know, building models from scratch in Insight Maker, or a couple other topics, then it's there for you. If you want to just scroll down to the bottom of this website, you can learn more about a lot of these, a lot of these things, but I didn't want to make that, I don't want to overwhelm you here. Um, this is uh, basically, uh, you know, the topic of a whole course, which is a course that some of you have taken or are taking right now with me. Um, but uh, anyway, I don't want to over overwhelm you with that. Um, but random number generators will be a part of some of the PVAs that we're working with. So I just want to let you know that they're there. Um, and uh, let's see. So I ask you to do a few tests with uh, random number generation models um, in Insight Maker. And that's something we could go through in this lecture if you'd like. Um, so uh, yeah, and then you know, here's here's all this extra stuff. So you see, you know, even like one third of the way through this website, that's basically the end of that lecture, and then everything else is kind of extras. You can read more in more detail about the mathematics of population modeling, et cetera, et cetera, if that's something you're into, and I recommend you do because it's cool. But um, but yeah, it's not it's it's all optional. So that's the first web uh, web page, and then you know you can we can you know just quickly introduce you to the remainder of the short course um, right here. Go to the Grizzly PVA. That's the second part. That's the first of the real world PVAs. So there's just an introduction to the Grizzly Bear PVA, how we're conce conceptualizing this system. Um, you know, we, we're breaking down the Grizzly Bear population into subcomponents, including cub, yearling, subadult, all the way to adult, and, uh, you know, assigning different vital rates like survival or fecundity to these different stages. Um, so that's how we're modeling the grizzly bear population. Um, and we're parameterizing it. That is, we're assigning the exact values of the parameters, survival, fecundity, that kind of thing. Uh, on the basis of real world data, and we're using a, uh, this scientific report here to uh, to get the data. So uh, I basically give you the the parameters, but it is derived from real world data. 
And um, this figure is just used to help us figure out what the starting abundance is for the population. This is just the total abundance of reproductive female grizzly bears over time. You can see it's expanding. Um, this is for the greater Yellowstone area. This is for Yellowstone Park proper. So you can just sort of figure out how many females there are in the population at any given time. Um, just a quick reminder that in population ecology, males don't really matter because even if you have a few males in a population, you know, most females are likely to be fertilized. Um, it's not really a limiting factor for most populations. You can imagine maybe there is a case, there are some species that are really monogamous. And if there are uh, only, you know, one male to every two females, then half the females might go unfertilized. And that would be a, an issue and you would have to model males. But most populations are not like that. Most wild populations are promiscuous to some extent. And uh, we don't actually need to keep track of males in most models. If you look at population ecology or population modeling papers, most papers you will find uh, use only females. They consider only females in the model. Anyway, that's just an aside, but um, you know, this, th this is what we really need to know is the number of reproductive females because those are the ones that are going to contribute offspring to the new next generation. Um, and so we go through the, the grizzly bear example and I won't go any, any, any more detail right now. It's all there. You can follow along in the video. You can follow along in the website and, um, and please ask questions if you have any on that. And then once you're done with that and you've answered the questions on web campus, you move over to the loggerhead PVA. And that's the final piece of this short course. And it's again, based on real world data. And even more importantly, it actually provided the basis for major shifts in the way we think about conserving sea turtles and other long-lived organisms. This was a hugely influential paper, this Crowder et al. paper um, and other, other papers by that group of co-authors. Um, hugely influential for conservation of these species. Um, and what we're, the model we're doing here is exactly the model that Crowder et al. used to make recommendations for management of this species. So that's what's really cool about this example is it is a real world example that had a huge impact on conservation. So again, I'm not gonna go through uh, too much on this right now, but um, you know, it's a really cool system. Um, so I, I provide a little background. This is the, the global or circumglobal range of the loggerhead sea turtle in the US. Its nesting beaches are really concentrated in like the southern, southeastern US, but, um, but you can find the adults and the, you can find the, the juveniles on the coast uh, and you can find those little, if you're really lucky, you can find a very young one floating in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and the Sargasso Sea. Um, but anyway, they are, uh, you can find them in their various stages of their life history all around the globe. Um, and they're, they have, they're facing multiple threats. And, and that's the whole point of this exercise is to try to figure out which of the threats are most important for us as humans, as society to mitigate. Um, and so uh, after you answer the, the questions of Web Campus on the loggerhead, that's the end of the short course. Again, if you have any questions uh, at any point, please put them on the discussion board so everyone can see them and learn from them. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for just a second and pause and see if there are any questions right now. And then maybe we could go and do an insight maker demo or two. Um, but I'm going to stop this for now. All right. Um, <laughs> what is PVA? Population viability analysis. Yeah, if, if I forgot to define that, I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> um, PVA is population viability analysis. Any other questions? Let me see if, Danielle, have you uh, been monitoring the, um, 
the chat to see if there are any any questions. Brandon answered the PVA question before I did. Um, but if we scroll up into the chat for those who didn't see um, Kyla's question um, about what is the attendance quiz for today. Um, so in case people didn't come today, uh, you don't have to submit it today. You'll just submit that code when you turn in PVA Lecture 3 sometime by the end of the week. Um, so that third question there, what is the access code from the live lecture? It's demography um, that's going to be related to that final um, PVA that you do. So just type that into the question box three. Um, but I typed it above for Kyla C or C. You can see the response. I'll type it again. But if you want to go ahead and start to work through one of the examples, I think that might be most helpful and we can all just interrupt if when we have questions. And yes to David, all by the, um, the PVA lecture one is the stuff I posted at the end of last week. So that's due today. That's just like the intro to show that you've started to think about what some of this stuff is. Um, and then the other two are due by the end of the week. So that would have been matching our original in-class schedule if we never had to make these shifts. Um, Paige asked about if we answer all three questions. Just let me show you. Um, let me share my screen. Oh, I don't, where'd it go? So when you open up one of these um, throughout the PDFs and the web pages, Kevin has highlighted where the short answers are, um, but I've copied those directly. So you'll just make a brief answer um, to each one. And you can just put it all in the same question box because um, you don't have to go crazy with your answers, which I put in the descriptions of each one of these quizzes. Um, just put it put something brief um, to show that you're getting the idea um, and that you went through it. Let me see if in the chat if that answers your question. Great. Um, David said due by Thursday. Nope. PVA two and three are all due by the end of the week. So do them on your own on your own schedule. And if you start one um, and then you're like, wow, actually I don't understand question three, um, go ahead, like Kevin said, and put that in that help forum. Um, and then you can go back and, and just add the answers that you need. No, Hannah, they're not in today's lecture. Kevin's gonna walk us through some of the, the stuff, um, but you'll need to go through his recorded lectures. They're like 15 to, to 30 minutes per PPA. Kyla asks, where are the recorded lectures? So that's what Kevin was showing you in his short course here. Where to go? Here. Um, so uh, you'll see that those are the PDFs of it. Um, but each one of these pages walks you exactly through it. So. Um, for example, um, and maybe Kevin, this is where you want to jump in if we're just going to do one. Um, he's got the website for it, which is where the questions are, and then you can play the video. And instead of going through that page yourself, um, we have uh, Kevin's beautiful voice talking over it. See, like this. <laughs> so. And I should say that the, the intro stuff, even if it may be the the less fun of the two. Um, it is it's a bit longer because I had to, there's a lot to introduce. There's a lot of concepts to introduce before uh, going through the, the fun real world uh, PVAs with grizzly bears and um, loggerheads. So it's, you'll find that that first one may take a lot longer than running through the grizzly bear example when you come to that and the loggerhead example, especially if you haven't taken my class yet and the concepts are totally new. And that's where we can help. Um, so if you have a question or if you wanna set up a time um, that we can answer some questions um, live too, I can do that. Danielle, are we uh, meeting again on Thursday or is that- No, I wasn't planning on it. 
Um, but if people do have questions, we can we can set up a time. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to be here if, if, to answer questions if if that's. Uh, um, and to answer Kyla's other question, um, if you haven't downloaded the study guide for exam three already, um, you should. I posted the five questions from Kelly's lecture, um, but uh, there's quite more questions from Kevin stuff since that's three lectures. Um, so you'll have to go through these questions and these are the possible short answers on um, all from that are taken from the live lectures that Kevin used to do. So um, I'll read through these again now that Kevin has posted his um, recordings in case some of these are no longer um, relevant. These are ones that were created, like I said, in past years. Um, but you should be able to answer all of these basic questions about what is stochasticity, what's a PVA um, for your exam. Okay, so I'll pass it back over to you then, um, Kevin. If sure. I can, I can still answer questions in the in the chat, of course. Yeah, and just stop me if if there's a question that comes up in the chat and I'm just like blabbering away, then you can stop me and and uh, we can answer the question together. Okay, for sure. All right, <laughs> um, I think maybe what might be helpful is just to run through a simple insight maker example, because again, this tool, if you're in my class, it's, you know, it really well at this point, but um, some of you are not, and it, uh, it might be helpful just to run through some basic, um, you know, getting started and uh, putting a model together. So and on that note, Kevin, would you say that people who have taken your class or are in it now, um, is there any reason that they um, need to stay on unless they want that refresher? Um, or they're going to help their <laughs> other students. Ah, right? uh, great. Uh, well, <laughs> it's, totally, it's totally up to them. I, I will okay. not hold against them if they decide to um, to log off. Okay, because if you're ready to jump right into those others, um, and that's fine as well. I just wanted well, to make sure if you were going to, but if you're going to go through some of the actual uh, Yellowstone or, or yeah, I thought, I thought I would, but maybe I would okay. start start with a real simple one, and then I okay. can introduce the Yellowstone Grizzly and Loggerhead. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, I, I just think it makes sense to start really simple. Uh, okay. for, those who are just getting started because that's the hardest part really is just getting started mm -hmm. um so um and i've tried to make it make it as easy as possible i've tried to provide links to existing insight maker models i'm not asking you to build your models from scratch um in this short course um for the yellowstone and the the grizzly and the loggerhead examples especially i'm not asking you to build those from scratch those are much more complex models um, but I want you to just be able to use them and, and to understand what they're doing. And so just a really brief, and again, it, you, there's an intro lecture that's recorded on YouTube that you can pause at your, and watch at your own time that goes through this in much, uh, much slower and, and hopefully, um, you know, if, if you don't understand what I'm talking about now, just go there. You should be able to understand what's going on. But you know, when you start in Insight Maker, you, um, here, let, let's, so you, you should see a screen that looks something like this. If you want to make a new insight, and again, I'm not asking you to do that, but if you want to make new insights, you can click on that button. You can clear this, this demo screen. Um, and I didn't share my screen, did I? Okay. So if you go into Insight Maker, um, and you, you can cl clear that demo screen. You just get this blank uh, workspace. Insight Maker is a stock and flow modeling system. And what do I mean by that? Well, uh, a stock represents a container of some material or some, some kind of something you put in a container that you can count. Uh, it could be water, it could be energy, but we in here in this, uh, in, in this short course, it's a population. So it's a, it's a container of wild animals, essentially. And so if we want to add a stock, we can add this thing. It looks like a blue box and we can name it, um, you know, squirrel or whatever we want to name it. Oh, that's the note. <laughs> um, 
So we can name the stock and uh, we can put an initial value on a stock. Um, the initial values over here, you can just say there's 100 squirrels. Now, if I were to simulate this model now, it doesn't change. There's no change in the population because a stock cannot change unless there is a flow to change it. A flow is a process that either adds to the stock or subtracts from the stock. You can add flows in and flows out. Um, a flow in, you have for a flow in, you drag, you, you can drag any number of flows out of this by clicking on that arrow symbol, but you, um, you can, by default, they're all pointing out. That means they're outflows, right? So if you wanna make any inflows, you have to flip it around and do like that. And so I'm just gonna delete some of these flows. So now we have one flow in and one flow out of this population. We can name the flows to make it more biologically realistic. I'm just gonna call this births and I'm gonna call this deaths. And I can add numbers onto this flow if I want. This flow, and there's a couple of ways to do it. I either change the flow rate in this panel off to the uh, right here, or I just click on this equal sign and say I have five new squirrels entering the population every time step. And here I have say two squirrels leaving the population every time step. So here I have the births five each year and the deaths only two each year. So there's a net gain of three squirrels every year. So we should see a growing population and we do. So that's really basic stock flow modeling. If the inputs are equal to the outputs, if I make this five, then we get an equilibrium condition. This is a condition where the, in, the inflow is equal to the outflow and there is no actual change in the stock, in the value of the stock, all right? Um, that's the real basics. Now let's make it more realistic. Let's make it a real population. To do that, um, we're going to have to uh, model exponential growth, which is the way real populations can grow. Um, and to do that, the number of deaths has to be a function of the total number of squirrels. Like the more squirrels there are, you know, the more mortalities there are gonna be, right? Because um, if, uh, if there's a 10,000 squirrels and the death rate is 5%, you know, you're, you're gonna uh, have 500 um, or whatever, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, total deaths, where if you have 10 squirrels and the death rate is 5%, well, you might have one, you know, might, might have zero mortality. So um, the total death rate and the total birth rate should be dependent on the number of squirrels. So there's this dependency here um, that ends up uh, producing exponential growth. So to do that, I'm just gonna add a couple of variables. These are just storage containers for information information storage containers. One information storage container is going to be the birth rate. That is the per capita birth rate. How many offspring does a female produce each year? Um, and this is going to be the death rate. And to enable a linkage between these rates and the actual flows, the number of births and the number of deaths, I just have to link these using these this link here, which just conveys a flow of information. And then I can just type in an equation. So the equation for the total number of births, I have to multiply the total number of squirrels by the birth rate. Each, each squirrel produces, say, 1.1 offsprings on average, um, then, or pups on average, I guess. Um, then you multiply that 1.1 by the total number of squirrels, and then you get the total number of births in the population. And the same with deaths, you just multiply the total squirrels by the death rate, and you have to define what the birth and death rate is. So say the birth rate is 1.1 per female, and the death rate is 0 0.5, so 50% die each year. What happens? You get exponential growth.
like really serious exponential growth. You start off with 100 squirrels, and by the end of 20 years, you have 1,300,000 squirrels in your population. So that's exponential growth. Now, uh, one other thing that you might uh, want to add is what's called a value slider, which makes it easier to change these vital rates. So I, for the birth and death rate, I'm going to add a value slider. And, um, oh, here, I'm going to change the maximum to two for the birth rate and the death rate. Can't really have more than a 100% uh, death rate. So I'm going to change the maximum to one. And so now I can just fiddle around with these rates here. And there we go. We can have a, a, a lower uh, exponential growth rate. Um, it's not quite as severe. Now we only have 5,500 squirrels by the end of 20 years. That's, uh, that's not too bad. And what if I had, what if the birth rate was lower than the death rate? Then I have what's called negative exponential growth. The population's declining exponentially because the death rate is exceeding the birth rate. And so we have a negative growth. If we want to see how this goes more than 20 years, look, by default, Insight Maker runs for 20 years. I can just change in the settings. I can change it to run for 100 years if I want and simulate. And now we see negative exponential growth occurring over a longer time frame. And at a certain time, you know, you get below one individuals, that's kind of extinction because you can't really have less than one. But we don't see, we don't quite see extinction here. It gets down to about 10 squirrels by uh, year 100. If I increase the death rate, um, it will probably go extinct within 100 years. There you go. So that's the real basics of population modeling. Again, these models are so simple, they're not really useful. It's just, it's just a way to get started with population modeling. Um, what's one thing we want to add that makes this a little more useful? Well, random number generators help us to uh, embrace uncertainty we have about the future. We can't project the future with certainty. Let's add some random number generators. And the first random number generator we will add is just on the death rate. So instead of computing the death rate deterministically as multiplying the population by the death rate, we're going to essentially flip coins for every individual in the population and count whether it dies or not, it doesn't die. And every time we do it, it might be a little different because the total number of coin flips that come out death um, ends up being different every year. And so the, what we do is we add a random number generator here. We can just go into the random number functions in Insight Maker on the right-hand panel of the equation editor and click on what's called the binomial distribution. And for the total number of coin flips that we're gonna do, we're gonna figure out the total number of deaths. We just put the total squirrel population in there. And we're gonna put the death rate as the probability that the coin comes out death. The, this coin happens to have two sides, one death and one life. It's, it's the coin of life. And so we can hit apply. And now we should see that there's some randomness. You see that the population is going up and down, up and down. It's, it still exhibits this general exponential decline, but it's go, it has this kind of variability um, to it. And if we, um, let's see, what do I wanna do next? Um, we could move the, the initial population down to 10 and we'll probably see even more variability. There we go. Again, the population's probably gonna go extinct at some point. Yep, oh, yep, kind of went extinct. Um, so that is including random number generator in the, in the model. Let's add one more random number generator uh, for the, the total births. And you don't have to understand exactly what we're doing. Just know that we're modeling variability in total births um, and we're going to use a random number distribution called the Poisson distribution, which is often used for modeling births. And all you need to do is feed in the total number of expected births, which is the total population times the birth rate. And now we have a fully stochastic model. And this type of stochasticity that we're modeling here, we call demographic stochasticity because the vital rates stay the same. The death rate is 0.21 here 
and the birth rate is 0.14 here, and it doesn't change throughout the whole simulation. The whole simulation, the birth and the death rate stay exactly the same, but there's still variability here. That's called demographic stochasticity. It's just inherent variability to these systems, inherent variability, even when the vital rates stay exactly the same. All right, let's look at another scenario where we keep the birth and the death rate about the same. We can probably see even more variability. There we go. Just completely random. And when you run it, you, if you're following along, if you're really good, I know I'm going fast. Oh, I got an extinction. But if I run it again, it might not go extinct. Let's find out. <laughs> oh, went extinct. Um, I can run it a little faster if, so that I don't take up all your time with this. That one didn't go extinct. So um, every time you run it, it's a little different. That's the definition of stochastic. It's just going to be different every time. There we go. And one of the cool things we can do is, is Insight Maker will run it many, many times for us. If we go to this tool, it's called Sensitivity Testing Tool. We can run it 50 or 100 times. We could plot each run if we want to. And we can run, sorry, I always do that. You have to select one of the, the stocks or flows that you want to monitor over time before you can actually run it. So I'm going to monitor the squirrel population over time and I'm going to do it 50 times. We're going to run 50 different replicates of this model for um, 100 years. There we go. And, and we see this huge spread. Now, this is the cloud of, of potential futures that we're talking about. We're embracing uncertainty by running the model many, many, many times. You can see uh, the actual models that we ran with this runs chart. And we can see all the different runs that we, that we did here. Um, some runs went really high, up, up to 100 from 10. Many went extinct, right? And we can't predict. You know, this population might go extinct. It might not go extinct. But what we can do is characterize the probability of extinction. And that's one of the things that we do with population viability analysis, PVA, um, is characterize the risk of extinction. Now, to do that, we just have to count up the number of times that our simulations went extinct and divide it by the total number of simulations. So let's say 50% of our simulation runs, that is, if we ran 50, 25 out of 50 went extinct, what's the extinction risk? Well, it's 50%, right? So 50% extinction risk just based on interpreting this whole cloud of possible futures. We can look in more detail and see um, which runs went extinct by looking at this runs table and looking at um, what happens by year 100. All you have to do is count up the number of times the population ends up at zero. So you have, here's run one, not extinct. Run, sorry, run one, not extinct. Run two, not extinct. Run, run three, not extinct. Run four, went extinct. Run five, went extinct. Run six, went extinct. So, so far there's a 50% extinction risk. You know, all you have to do is count up all the runs, all, count up all the non-zeros, count up all the zeros, figure out how many zeros there were, how many extinctions after year 100, and then divide by the total number of simulation runs, which was 50. And that's how we can compute extinction risk, which is really, it's kind of the first use of population viability analysis in conservation biology was just simply characterizing extinction risk, all right? And so one, one thing you're asked to do in um, the first of the, the three mini lectures, basically, is just to characterize the impact of demographic stochasticity at different starting abundances. So you start the abundance at 10, you see this huge impact. What happens if you start it at 500? Does, does the impact of demographic stochasticity or inherent variability in population processes, does that matter when the population is large? That ends up being a super fundamental uh, concept of conservation biology. So that's something I want you to do on your own. Um, uh, the other thing you can do is add variability to the vital rates themselves. That kind of represents, you know, if the birth rate's really good one year and it's really unfavorable the other year, that can represent environmental variation from year to year. So you can actually add random number generators on the birth and death rate themselves. So that's kind of 
uh, that's, that's a different type of, of stochasticity. And so I, one of the exercise, one of the exercises asks you to explore the implications of that type of variability, what's, what's called environmental stochasticity, which is variation in the population vital rates over time. Demographic stochasticity is inherent variation in the total birth and death rate, regardless or <clears throat> when you keep these vital rates constant over time, just inherent variability. And then environmental stochasticity is when you let these vital rates themselves vary over time, all right? So th those are the two different types of stochasticity we'll consider. They're very different and they have different implications for conservation. All right, um, the other thing I'd like to just quickly go through, why don't I stop sharing for just one second, see if there are any questions, and then I will quickly introduce the real world PVAs. I know I went kind of fast through that, but again, the video is there for you um, to work through at your own pace. Any questions before I just quickly introduce the real world PVAs? Go for it. All right, let's do it. I'm gonna share screen one more time. All right, so I'm gonna go back to the Grizzly PVA. So th there will be, a, you will see a link to uh, the model for you to uh, load and modify. Um, after the intro, we go through the intro, it says you can clone the base Grizzly Bear model here. So let me explain what cloning means. Um, but uh, what you can do is click on this. I'm, I'm gonna open it in a new tab. If you just click on it, it will just open the, the model, but I'm gonna open it in a new tab so we can go back and forth if we need to. This is what the grizzly bear PBA looks like. Now, instead of just a single stock representing the whole population, we have several stocks representing different segments of the population. Um, that, that may have different vital rates and uh, different contributions to the next year in terms of their ability to reproduce. So we have cubs, that's the newborn first year of life stage. We have yearling, which represents the second year of life for the grizzly bears. We have subadult one, subadult two, subadult three, which represents the third, fourth, and fifth year of life. And then after that, they are considered adults and they're reproductive. So they can breed at that point. So they have a few subadult stages where they still might have fairly high survival, but they're not yet able to reproduce. All right. So that's how we're conceptualizing the life history of the grizzly bear population at Yellowstone. Um, this is the only stage that can reproduce that this link here, this dotted line represents uh, the fact that to, to compute the total number of births, we have to know the total number of adults or the total number of reproductive females. And then we also have to know the fecundity. Now, in this model, you'll see that all the vital rates are zero, right? And that means the reason is because I want you to put numbers on these uh, vital rates. I want you to be able to go into the table um, of estimated fecundity and survival and put those values in yourself just so you um, get familiar with parameterizing a population model. When we say parameterizing, we just mean put real numbers on the, the uh, variables uh, that are important for that model. All right, so fecundity here, you, you would have to get from the table and the table looks like this. So we can see fecundity is actually 0.362 in this early uh, stage um, of the, well, of the study. So uh, this study started in 1983 when the population was really, really tiny. And then we have different estimates for 2002 to 2011 when the population was larger, all right? We're gonna start off by using the estimates from the early stage, which represents a low density scenario uh, when the population was, was growing and uh, was at low densities. Um, and so fecundity is 0.362, so we can just go in and add that uh, to the, the model. Now, one thing 
that I would like to show you is that um, when, you, when you load a model, you may not be able to modify the model in great detail. You might not be able to add new variables and stuff because it's my model. I own this model. But if you want to be able to make changes to the model and um, you know, edit it and you know, have it in your Insight Maker um, list of, of your models, all you have to do is clone the Insight. So again, uh, I was a little too fast there. What you need to do is go to the top right and you should see if you're signed in to your Insight Maker account. If you're not signed in, you won't see this. But if you are signed into your Insight Maker account, you should see this clone insight link. Just click on it and uh, say, yes, I do want to clone it. And then it'll make a clone of that model that now lives in your list of Insight Maker models. It's your model to work with now. You've made a copy of it and it lives in your Insight Maker repository and you can change it and make edits to it and make notes and whatever you want um, in this model, all right? And so I would recommend doing that first, cloning your model, and then adding fecundity. This is 0.362. You can either go into the value equation or you can just type in 0.362 right here. And you can do that with all the different vital rates. I won't do it with you right here, but um, that is one of your tasks to parameterize this model, run it. Um, just make sure you understand it first. I mean, so you have these different stocks. This represents, this flow represents the process of cubs transitioning to yearlings. This process represents the, the uh, yearlings transitioning to subadults and so on and so forth. So it's fairly simple to understand. Um, and that's, that's what I'm going to, you know, so um, you can go through the, the exercises. The exercises just involve parameterizing the model with the low density vital rates and, you know, answering or exploring what the implications are there. And then changing the vital rates to represent those vital rates that were estimated when the population got larger. Trying to figure out what changed between the two, which vital rates changed the most. And then we're going to add a density dependence process. That is the vital rate that changed the most. We're going to allow that to, to continue to change linearly as the population gets bigger. That process is called density dependent because that vital rate will become less and less favorable as the population gets larger due to factors like crowding and competition. Um, you know, population growth becomes lower and lower potentially as the population gets bigger just because there's too many, that the animals become less healthy, less able to reproduce. And so that's, we're gonna introduce that process and we're gonna to try to figure out what is the carrying capacity of grizzly bears in Yellowstone Park? We can answer that question with this model. So um, that's really all I wanted to say about this model. Um, so the next model, is the loggerhead sea turtle, where were we? There we go, go to loggerhead PVA. And again, I provide an Insight Maker link with the Yellowstone, sorry, the, the loggerhead sea turtle. There are no sea turtles in Yellowstone, as far as I know. Um, and uh, at some point, you'll see a link to the Insight Maker model. So um, I, again, give you the vital rates for the model. Um, and I just talk a little bit about what a matrix population model is, because essentially what we're doing in this exercise is building a matrix population model. We're going to implement it in Insight Maker, but it's important to know what we're doing is called matrix population modeling. Um, vital rates you, you will see sometimes are, are displayed in a, what's called a matrix. And um, you see that the different stages in the life uh, history of the animal are both representing the columns and the rows of this matrix. And all this represents is the transition rates from one stage, from one life stage to the next, all right? So any, any element in this matrix represents a transition rate. This represents here, this 0.703, 
represents a transition from uh, small juvenile to small juvenile, which means the probability of staying small juvenile is about 70% in this loggerhead sea turtle population. These over here, these are transition rates too, but they actually represent reproduction. So it's a, essentially a transition from a reproductive stage, like an adult stage, to offspring. A female is basically producing offspring or transitioning. <laughs> like one year, it's just a female. The next year, there's a whole bunch of new offspring. So uh, every female produces 61.896 uh, new offspring uh, or hatchlings each year. All right. Um, at some point, I provide a link to the PVA, which is right here, projecting the loggerhead population in Insight Maker. First, clone the baseline loggerhead model here. So I'm going to open this link. You can take a quick look at the loggerhead PVA. It looks fairly similar to the Yellowstone Grizzly PVA. It has uh, different life history stages. It's really important in a species like a loggerhead sea turtle to model life stages because life stages here are incredibly different. The hatchling stage is tiny and is subject to being eaten by almost anything that that crawls or swims. And the adult stage is so big, it is somewhat vulnerable to shark attack, but even sharks have a tough time eating full-grown loggerhead sea turtles or any of the sea turtle species. Um, so uh, they're very different. <laughs> Obviously, the hatchling is very different from the adult, so it's really important to model these life history stages separately for a species like this. Again, we have uh, transition rates from hatchling to small juvenile, so on and so forth. Those are the flows in this model, and we have a reproductive process this time. Both the subadults and the adults can produce offspring, so both of those contribute to the total births via this dotted line here. And here, what we're gonna do is once you've uh, understood the model, again, clone the model first, just clone it here. And you can then you, you can make whatever change you'd like to make to the model and you can run the model. This time, I did parameterize it for you. This is the base model from Crowder et al, 1994. So this is the base model. What I'm gonna ask you to do here, instead of parameterize the model, I want you to change the parameters according to some scenarios, all right? And so let's go through one of the scenarios that, um, so this, where it says group exercise, loggerhead management. This is where we're gonna look at threat mitigation efforts. And we're gonna look at several different threats and try to mitigate them. So the first one is, um, one, one of the threats to loggerhead sea turtles is the destruction of nesting beaches or the uh, alteration of nesting beaches. So what if we protect nest sites? That would improve fecundity of the model by allowing more females to breed successfully. So we're going to model two different scenarios. One, uh, you know, basically different intensities of nest site protection. We can either improve fecundity to 1.5 times its current value or double it to two times the current value. So then you can go in to your model. Gosh, this Zoom link is kind of Oh, there it is. Okay, you can move it. <laughs> um, okay, so the clone of loggerhead. Okay, um, so now we can go into fecundities, right, and double them, for instance. So what if I were to double the subadult fecundity? It's going to be essentially 9.2, and this is going to be 122 or 123 or something like that. Kevin, I just want to point out that um, we've got four minutes left of general class time. So I don't know if you wanted to open up for yeah, more that's, questions or show yeah, one yeah. more. That, that's all I want you to do. So just, um, right. So just try to implement the, uh, the management actions that are indicated in this group exercise. If you have questions, just post them on the board. And um, yeah, I can, if there are any questions, um, please let me know either now or through the comments uh, discussion. I have a question right now, Kevin. Yeah. So uh, you were trying to double the fecundity for the insight and it said the max value. I, I know how to do that, but I don't know if everybody does knows how to change it for the um, max value to be more so that they can actually input 
123. Yeah, I, I just realized that as I was doing that. That's a really good point. I'm going to do that now on the actual PBA so that if you clone it after this, I'm going to put the maximum. I didn't realize that was, that was an issue until just now. The slider max should be 200 for adult fecundity just so to allow you to do that. So I'm going to save that model. And now if you clone it now, you should be able to increase the fecundity to the amount that I suggested you should. So thanks, <laughs> Leela. Um, there's also a comment in the chat. If you see Kevin, it says, which flow or text level is highlighted when you change fecundity? Um, okay, so uh, there's a couple fecundities that both subadults and adults can produce offspring. So, um, you can see that the adult fecundity uh, is this one, 61.8, and the subadult fecundity is this one. So each subadult produces 4.6 hatchlings in the next year, and each adult produces 61.8 hatchlings. Um, um, Kevin, uh, we don't, you don't, not sharing the screen. Oh, I stopped sharing, didn't I? Yeah. So, uh, Okay, so this, this one here is the fecundity. So you can change the fecundity here, although I shouldn't have changed it because, all right, uh, whatever. Um, okay, so I'll change it back to its base value, but um, you can change it here and here. So these are the two fecundity values. Does that make sense? So you don't have to be highlighting a bubble. You're just going to use the uh, drag yeah, bar. So you can, you can either you can use the slider here, or um, you can just type directly in here. Both are perfectly fine. Um, one questions? of the questions says, "How do you get the sliders to show up?" You have to click in the white space. So just click anywhere in the white space. If you if you click on one of the variables or stocks, you will see a different um, you know menu in the right hand corner. Just click on the white space, and you'll see the sliders. Uh, Danielle, uh, can you keep? If there's any other questions, just uh, voice them to me. <laughs> okay. I mean, class time's done, so please do, um, if you have more questions, ask. We can stay here a few minutes and answer them. Um, but otherwise, let's please thank Kevin for helping us this whole week with his PBA stuff. All right. It's my pleasure. And this is recorded, so if you do need to go back and, and look at one of these things, um, you can watch this, watch other videos, ask us in the chat. Um, so Jake says, what's the code the, to get that attendance verification? It's just demography. Um, Colton says, what's the extra credit for PVA lecture two? Um, that's if you do um, on the PVA lecture two uh, website or PDF that Kevin has posted, there's a question that says optional short answer and you can get an extra credit point if you do that one. Does that answer your question, Colton? Okay, Kevin, um, it looks like people are uh, leaving pretty quickly, but I'll share um, another Zoom link with you if we want to chat really quick. Yes, that sounds good. Let's do that. Um. <laughs> oh, great. Helpful for a class project. Good. <laughs> okay, bye, everyone. All right. Bye.